This program contains graphic images and discussion of medical procedures. Viewer discretion is advised. Um, these are my disclosures. Um, I think the first thing we need to do is to define the pathology. So an intramural hematoma is really the formation of thrombus in the aortic wall uh, with an absence of a visible intimal tear of blood flow between the layers. It can occur anywhere in the aorta and it's labeled type A and type B just the same way as the sections. It usually presents with sudden onset of uh, chest pain, upper back or abdominal pain. It mimics aortic dissection in its clinical presentation. Hypertension is almost universal, and it's refractory in about 30% of patients. About 5 to 10% of patients can present with spinal cord ischemia as the initial presentation, and it actually may be an incidental finding when a CT is done for some other pathology. Now, the initial management is very similar to aortic dissection. It is conservative, and it's re it implies control of the blood pressure, usually with beta blockers initially, and pain control. This is uh, conservative management, except if the maximum aortic diameter is greater than four centimeters, in which case uh, rupture uh, can occur. If there's a pleural effusion at presentation, which implies some degree of uh, uh, seepage, uh, it can be uh, uh, just serous fluid from a very, very thin um, uh, outer layer. And in patients with intractable pain and refractory hypertension, and again, you can see how difficult it is to define intractable and refractory, uh, but it can be a patient where you're trying to control the hypertension and you can't do it, or patients that require increasing doses of opioids uh, for control of uh, pain. Now, it is recommended that you do, on conservative management, that you do serial CT scans on the first day, at day four and at day 10, and, uh, and that allows you to determine if patients that you initially uh, try to do conservative management are failing the conservative management. So just a couple of uh, things to look for on the, on the follow-up CT scans. Uh, you have uh, ulcer-like projections, uh, of which you can see here. And basically, this looks like a penetrating ulcer. However, the difference is usually in penetrating ulcers, you have plaque accompanying the, the finding, whereas in these, you have no plaque, and it's part of the intramural hematoma. You can also see what's called an intramural blood pool, which are areas of focal contrast enhancement. Uh, within the intramural hematoma without lumen communication. And you can see an example of this here. You can see a couple of blood pools right here. And these are things that you would look on the, on the CT scan on follow-up. And if one of these develop, it would be an indication for intervention. So the question is, is uh, intramural hematoma different than an aortic dissection? This is actually a, a patient that we saw at UCLA as a patient of Dr. Rickberg who presented with this intimal tear and uh, almost thrombosed uh, what we call false lumen. Six weeks later, it was all healed up and the, uh, uh, all you saw was the intramural hematoma. So the question is, if you see this patient uh, at this time, uh, would you call it an intramural hematoma or an aortic dissection? I would submit to you that this is probably a continuum of disease. It is a similar pathology in the aortic wall. It's just a, a different type of uh, presentation. Here's a patient of mine that I saw in 2014 that presented with what appears to be an intramural hematoma, has uh, some blood pooling and what appears to be dissection in the uh, lower abdomen. She was actually asymptomatic at the time of presentation, so uh, we decided to treat this patient uh, conservatively. Here she is in 2015, the thoracic aorta is all healed up. She has some blood pools in the lower uh, abdomen and the, uh, and the dissection appears to have been converted into uh, some blood pools with the intramural hematoma. Again, the patient remaining asymptomatic. Here's the same patient in 2016, and now she has uh, what appears to be a, just an area of uh, 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 small intramural hematoma, but the aorta is completely uh, healed. And here she is uh, just last month, a, cu a couple of months ago, uh, where the aorta is uh, completely normal. What was interesting in this patient is uh, on this CT scan, I actually 
looked at the CT and was very happy and told her about uh, uh, that the aorta was completely healed. And uh, it turns out that on the same CT scan, there were some uh, pulmonary emboli that were detected uh, and she was asymptomatic from that process uh, also. Turns out she has a hypercoagulable uh, uh, condition. If we look at the IRAD registry, uh, they reported on 107 patients uh, with intramural hematoma, and the conclusion was that most of these patients can be treated medically, and aortic enlargement is less common, and the process has a much less uh, uh, complications compared to aortic dissection, uh, defining what they call a more benign course. So what are the indications for endovascular intervention? Increased intramural thickness on follow-up CT, extension of the intramural hematoma, new ulcer-like projections, new aortic wall pool, intractable pain and refractory hypertension. Those uh, are uh, clinical indications that uh, intervention uh, may be indicated. Now, when you look at the natural history and which patients end up with intervention, about 75% of the patients uh, require a, a continued conservative uh, uh, follow-up, whereas 25% uh, of the patients uh, end up uh, undergoing uh, TVAR without any uh, further imaging at initial presentation. So what are the considerations when you're using an endovascular graft for intramural hematoma? You do not want to exceed more than 10% oversizing. Covering all affected aorta is uh, the ideal intervention. If it's not possible, be aware that you can cause a new tear and the extension of the intramural hematoma. I actually had a patient several years ago that had an intramural hematoma starting about 10 centimeters uh, from the, uh, uh, it was about 15 centimeters from the left subclavian artery. I just placed a graft just above that, and uh, three weeks later she presented with retrograde intramural hematoma into the aortic arch. So it, it does happen. So you want to make sure that the proximal landing zone is on a healthy, normal appearing aorta. You want to avoid ballooning, and retrograde dissection is clearly a risk, and I would avoid bare metal uh, uh, proximal stent configurations. So in conclusion, I think intramural hematoma may be a continuum of uh, medial aortic pathology that involves dissection. Uh, a conservative management is the first line of therapy with control of hypertension. TVAR uh, is indicated for specific both acute and subacute indications. About 25% of patients uh, will uh, require intervention on initial presentation, and the rest of them can be managed uh, medically. I think close follow-up is indicated in all cases. Uh, intervention, the intervention of choice is an endovascular intervention, and today the need for an open repair is very rare. I see that Dr. Uh, uh, Starnes uh, just got up to ask some <laughs> questions, so I'm starting to get a little nervous here. Uh, <laughs> and I thank you for your attention. William, congratulations on a very nice presentation, a thorough review of the literature. I, you, you provided that one anecdote at the end about uh, the risk of retrograde propagation and development of an intramural hematoma. I've actually had the exact opposite. Not, not, uh, I'm, not, I'm not diminishing the risk of retrograde dissection, but I had a 55-year-old guy that came in who had a a small entry tear that we could identify distal to the left subclavian, like you uh, said, but had intramural hematoma that extended all the way across the arch and all the way down to the aortic valve, and it was eight millimeters in thickness circumferentially. Our cardiac surgeons didn't, weren't interested in doing anything for this gentleman, so we actually put in a stent graft and just covered that entry tear, and in about two weeks, the intramural hematoma that was around the ascending was completely gone. So I'm wondering if you have had a similar experience to that or if anyone else has, because um, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. No. Uh, the question is uh, whether it wouldn't have behaved similarly without the, the, the TVAR, because like I, like I showed in that first case, um, and even in the patient with the follow-up, I mean, these things, it's interesting how they can behave over the course of time. I mean, this, this patient that I saw in 2014 and just saw a couple of months ago, uh, is, is a prime example of if you 
you know, if the patient is asymptomatic and the blood pressure is adequately controlled, there's healing that occurs uh, mm -hmm. in the aorta. So, uh, you know, it's hard to tell. I would be very leery of putting an endovascular graft uh, in an area where there is intramural hematoma because I think the intima uh, and whatever media is left attached to the intima is, is, uh, is very fragile, and I think you can create uh, a tear. So yeah. it's, uh, it's a, that's, that, that's a difficult uh, uh, case to sort of know exactly what's the best thing to yeah. do. Thank you.